Hello, welcome to PC Mag Live. I'm Dan Costa. He is Sasha Segan, and we've got a great show for you today. We're going to talk about the top tech news of the day. We're going to break down, we're going to pull one thing off the shelf in the lab and show it to you and answer some of your reader questions. Sasha, let's get to the big news of the day. Finally, Office is available on the iPad. Microsoft made an announcement. What the hell took so long? Well, yeah, I mean, it's only three or four years late, really. <laughs> That's well. um, exactly. You know, they, they only dithered under the Steve Ballmer regime over supporting the number one tablet uh, in the world for years and years and years and years. But you know what? Office for iPad is pretty great. The question about Office for iPad is not, is it a great office suite? And it does appear to be a great office we're suite. We're testing it right now. It just went live yesterday. We're testing it right now, but it has a lot of the features and a lot of the, uh, a lot of the visual stuff that will make users of desktop office very familiar. The question is, does it really matter anymore? I think, I, I think it does. I think, it, I think the thing that Microsoft has lost out on by not doing this sooner is that people want to live inside an ecosystem. People love Office. They just want to be able to send themselves files, open them in Office, close them, send them back, and not have to worry about any compatibility. People will pay a couple of bucks for that. And analysts are saying that that market alone, the Office for iPad, Office for other devices market, could generate an extra billion dollars in the next year for Microsoft. Yeah, and, and Not a lot of money for Microsoft, but a lot of money. And something that's important about Office for iPad, it is not free, or rather it is free to play. It is the Candy Crush Saga model, where um, you can download it for free and you get some very limited features, and then you have to sign up for an Office 365 subscription to really use it. And there are these different levels of Office 365 descriptions that get you different amounts of lives and power-ups. And uh, all in all, this really seems more uh, focused on the small business and enterprise market than on your average consumer who just wants to tootle around, you know, writing their diary on their iPad. Yeah, we'll have our full reviews up on Monday. You can read exactly how much you can do with this software. Also in the news today, the Obama administration has released its plan to reform the NSA spying system. Uh, they said that they wanted to make changes. They na we now know what some of those changes are going to be. You, I mean, the details are where the devil's really going to be. But fundamentally, they've committed to not store, not capturing all of the data that we send out and not storing all the data that they capture. Uh, the Obama administration has released their cosmetic plan to pass the buck and avoid blame in the NSA spying situation. Um, what they have agreed to is uh, to tell the wireless carriers that they have to hold on to the data in case the government might want it later. Um, how does this change anything? I mean, the government can still, is still potentially going to be able to request any information about any of us ever. It's just, you know, it's just what filing cabinet and what building the information is in. That's right. They'll have to request the information from the carriers. And of course, the carriers and the telcos are saying, well, wait a minute, who's going to fit the bill for all this storage? And how much do you want? And how quickly do you want to be able to access it? None of that's been worked out. And the carriers, you can tell, aren't really thrilled with this idea of having to be the data warehouse for the government. We have a great idea here. No one should be the data warehouse because this data shouldn't be warehoused. That is a fair point, and that's the point that a lot of civil libertarians are making. That's not even on the table. No one is suggesting that except for a few privacy advocates. No one in the government is proposing that. In fact, in the House, they've got a bill which will basically mean that they don't have to, uh, there won't be the pre-approval. They'll be able to actually get the data and then ask for approval to read it later. And here I am on the fringe of the political system again. Again, well, not terribly surprising. You know who else is pushing limits? Facebook. They spent $2 billion for Oculus Rift this week. Now they've outlined plans to basically connect the world. This is part of the internet.org project that Mark Zuckerberg is putting together. But they're going to use drones. They're going to use lasers. They're going to use some very sophisticated technology to try and wire or unwire or connect in any way parts of the world that do not have any access right now. The drones are the only really interesting part of this because if you hear, oh, drones, satellites, lasers, well, it turns out that, uh, for instance, satellite, satellite internet is a very old, very well-established technology. Anyone who has a house on, out in the country that uses HughesNet knows all about this. Um, the lasers sound like they are just a, a form of a line of sight, point-to-point mm -hmm. Backhaul, which we've been seeing in uh, which we've been seeing uh, in microwave for years, but the drones. The idea of the drones is that it's similar to Google's giant weather balloons, mm -hmm. where where there's no infrastructure, they sort of fly these things over, bouncing internet signals off each other. 
It's an interesting idea, but what disturbs me about this whole thing, coming both from the Google weather balloons and the Facebook drones, is that it's, it's basically imperialism. These guys are saying, oh, we want to wire up all these countries that are unwired using our crazy high-tech things. And I don't hear the voices of the people in the countries themselves participating but, in this process. Well, there's, I mean, they're just getting started. They're coming up with engineering models for figuring out how to avoid the base tower model where you put up a tower and then you have to go line of sight around that tower. So I think that these are engineering questions and they're engineers trying to solve engineering problems. Um, I, I, I don't think there's any downside to providing internet access to all these regions. No, there's no downside to providing internet access. But uh, if you are providing internet access to a particular region, I would want the people in that region to be telling you what they need and their ideas of how to get it. Not for you to decide what they need and then hand it down to them. I think they need what they're, the, the only decisions being made is how to connect them. What they use it for is going to be up to them. I think, once again, you're on the extreme of the political spectrum. Um, let's, <laughs> but let's move to more, more solid ground here. We've got a reader question. This question comes in from Jason. It's a relatively complicated, hardcore question. He asked on YouTube whether about the new WRT 1900 AC router from Linksys, which is just off the line. And would that be a good choice to replace his current WRT 54G router? And he's living in a 1,400 square foot apartment, so pretty house. decent house with a basement. Pretty decent sized house, uh, a basement. You got to go mm -hmm. between floors. Is that a good replacement model? You've got some answers. Yeah. Now, in in Jason's original question, he actually laid out every device in his house and the okay. basic layout of his house, which we're not going to go into right now. But I asked Samara Lin, our networking expert, to take a look at his question, and she said, "Yes, you do need a high-end dual-band router for this kind of layout." And the WRT 1900 AC looks promising, but the problem is no one has actually tested it yet. It's not out. We are going to get it relatively soon. Look for Samara's review. That will answer the question for you. But also, with routers, she says, it's, it's good to wait a few months to make sure that they clean out the bugs and they have a firmware rev or two before you install it. Because uh, a lot of these devices are essentially released as a, as a public beta. Yeah, absolutely. So there you go. Good answer from Samara Lynn. Let's move on to one cool thing. We test thousands of products here in our lab in New York City. Every day we take one thing off the shelf and show it to you live. That thing today is very cool. It is the Roku streaming stick. I have Amazon Prime in my ear. Now Roku has been making you know, internet connected boxes that connect your TV to the internet and allow you to stream movies and videos and TV shows for a number of years now. They've been a tad behind this on this stick phenomena, which is obviously designed to look very much like the Google Chromecast. But it's got a little bit higher price point, 50 bucks but a lot of cool features. Yeah, I mean, basically this is a Roku 2. So you get all of these Roku channels and all the Roku streaming services and the Roku interface, which is just, uh, just a lot more complete than the Chromecast mm -hmm. um, in the form of a stick. It also comes with a remote control, which we didn't actually bring out. We should have done that. Um, the Chromecast requires another device to control it, either mm -hmm. your iPad or something using Chrome, which is not that big of a lift, but it does require you have another device. This comes with a physical remote that lets mm -hmm. you change channels. Um, you can also use the app on your phone to control it. Mm -hmm. So you plug it, into your, you plug it into your TV over here. It's powered by USB. Very cool. You're going to be able to read our full review of the Roku stick on Monday. We're still testing it. We're going to bring it right back over to the lab and finish our tests. And that's PC Mag Live for today. Remember, you can send us your questions on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter, or just plain old email. We will answer them live on air. Tune in Monday for a brand new show.